Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my review of The Outsider by Albert Camus. So, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to go in and check out some of my tabs throughout, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and review rating at the end. So, Marcel will not pretend. After the death of his mother, everyone is shocked when he shows no sadness. And when he commits a random act of violence in Algiers, society is baffled. Why would this seemingly law-abiding bachelor do such a thing? Why does he show no remorse, even when it could save his life? His refusal to satisfy the feelings of others only increases his guilt in the eyes of the law. Soon Merso discovers that he is being tried not simply for his crime, but for his lack of emotion, a reaction that condemns him for being an outsider. So one thing I didn't know that I learned from uh, the author bio is that Camus was killed in a, a road accident in 1960. So um, I think a great place just to start with this is for me to read out the first couple of paragraphs because they give you a feel for Camus writing style and also the translation which is uh, by Joseph Laredo. I may at some point try and reread this in French but my French is not good enough to do that yet. <laughs> Mother died today or maybe yesterday I don't know. I had a telegram from the home. Mother passed away. Funeral tomorrow. Yours sincerely. That doesn't mean anything. It may have been yesterday. The old people's home is at Marengo, 50 miles from Algiers. I'll catch the two o'clock bus and get there in the afternoon. Then I can keep the vigil and I'll come back tomorrow night. I asked my boss for two days off and he couldn't refuse under the circumstances, but he didn't seem pleased. I even said, it's not my fault. He didn't answer. Then I thought maybe I shouldn't have said that. After all, it wasn't for me to apologize. It was more up to him to offer me his condolences, but he probably will do the day after tomorrow when he sees me in mourning. For the moment, it's almost as if mother was still alive. After the funeral though, the death will be a classified fact and the whole thing will have assumed a more official aura. I like this little line. After that, the street gradually became deserted. The shows had all started, I suppose. Only the shopkeepers and the cats remained. So I think this paragraph's really well written, so I want to read this out. Um, on my way upstairs in the dark, I bumped into old Salamano, my next door neighbour. He had his dog with him. they have been together for eight years. The Spaniel has got a skin disease, mange I think which makes almost all its hair fall out and covers it with brown blotches and scabs. After living with it for so long, the two of them alone together in one tiny room, Salamano has ended up looking like the dog. He's got reddish scabs on his face and his hair is thin and yellow. And the dog has developed something of its master's walk, all hunched up with its neck stretched forward and its nose sticking out. They look as if they belong to the same species and yet they hate each other. Twice a day, at 11 o'clock and 6, the old man takes his dog for a walk. In eight years, they haven't changed their route. You can see them in the Rue de Lyon, the, dra the dog dragging the man along until old Salamano stumbles. Then he beats the dog and swears at it. The dog cringes in fear and trails behind. At that point, it's the old man's turn to drag it along. When the dog forgets, it starts pulling its master along again and gets beaten and sworn at again. Then they both stop on the pavement and stare at each other, the dog in terror, the man in hatred. It's like that every day. When the dog wants to urinate, the old man won't give it time and drags it on, so that the spaniel scatters a trail of little drops behind it. But if the dog ever does it in the room, then it gets beaten again. It's been going on like that for eight years. Celeste always says, it's dreadful, but in fact you can never tell. When I met him on the stairs, Salamano was busy swearing at his dog. He was saying, filthy, lousy animal, and the dog was whimpering. I said, good evening, but the old man went on swearing. So I asked him what the dog had done. He didn't answer. He just went on saying, filthy, lousy animal. I could just about see him bent over his dog, busy fiddling with something on his collar. I asked again a bit louder. Then, without turning round, he answered with a sort of suppressed fury. He's always there! Then he set off, dragging the animal after him as it trailed its feet along the ground, whimpering. Yeah, Biggie, you're always there! I don't actually know where he is. And then we get this little section here, um, where I think it was his name, Ray? Raymond, yeah. He'd beaten her till she'd bled. Before that, he hadn't used to beat her. I used to hit her, but sort of affectionately. She'd yell a bit. I closed the shutters and it had finished the way it always does, but this time I really mean it, and I don't think I've punished her enough. He then explained that this was what he needed some advice about. He stopped to adjust the wick on the lamp that which was charring. I was still listening. I drank almost a litre of wine and my temples were burning. I was smoking Raymond's cigarettes because I'd run out. The last trams were passing and the few remaining street noises fading away with them into the distance. Raymond went on. What annoyed him was that he still felt like sleeping with her, but he wanted to punish her. First he thought of taking her to a hotel and calling in the vice squad to cause a scandal and have her registered as a prostitute. After that he'd gone to some friends he had in the underworld. They had no ideas. And as Raymond pointed out to me, so much for being in the underworld. That's what he'd told them and they then suggested marking her. But that wasn't what he wanted. He'd think it over. First he wanted to ask me something. 
Then again, before he asked me, he wanted to know what I thought about his story. I told him that I hadn't thought about it, but it was interesting. He asked me if I thought there was some deceiving going on, and as far as I could see, it did seem as if there was some deceiving going on, and if I thought she should be punished and what I'd do in his position, and I said you could never tell, but I understood why he should want to punish her. I drank a bit more wine. He lit a cigarette and told me his plan. He wanted to write her a letter which would really hurt and at the same time make her sorry. Then, when she came back, he'd go to bed with her and, right at the crucial moment, he'd spit in her face and throw her out. I agreed that that would punish her alright, but Raymond told me that he didn't feel capable of writing the kind of letter that was needed and that he'd thought I might draft it for him. When I didn't say anything, he asked me if I'd mind doing it right away and I said no. Raymond sounds like a right... You know what he sounds like. This made me chuckle, uh... <laughs> I then told her about my boss's proposal and Marie said she'd like to see Paris. I told her that I'd lived there once and she asked me what it was like. I said, it's dirty, full of pigeons and dark courtyards. The people have all got white skin. And then uh, our protagonist ends up in prison and we get this paragraph which I think is really beautifully written. It was soon after that that she wrote to me. And it was from that point on that the things I've never liked talking about began. But after all, I mustn't exaggerate it and it was easier for me than for others. When I was first in prison, though, the worst thing was that I kept thinking like a free man. For instance, I'd suddenly want to be on a beach and to be able to walk down to the sea. When I imagined the sound of the first little waves under the soles of my feet, the feel of the water on my body and the freedom it would give me, I'd suddenly realise how closed in I was by my prison walls. But that only lasted a few months. After that, I thought like a prisoner. I'd look forward to my daily walk in the courtyard or to my lawyer's visits, and I managed quite well the rest of the time. I often thought in those days that even if I'd been made to live in a hollow tree trunk with nothing to do but look up at the bit of sky overhead, I'd gradually have got used to it. I'd have looked forward to seeing birds fly past or clouds run together, just as here I looked forward to seeing my lawyer's curious ties and just as, in another world, I used to wait for Saturdays to embrace Marie's body. And come to think of it, I wasn't in a hollow tree. There were others unhappier than I was. Anyway, it was an idea of mother's and she often used to repeat it, that you ended up getting used to everything. And another great paragraph here. Between my mattress and my bed plank, I'd actually found an old scrap of newspaper which had gone all yellow and transparent and was almost stuck to the material. It was a small news story. The beginning was missing, but it must have taken place in Czechoslovakia. A man had left some Czech village to go and make his fortune. 25 years later, he'd come back rich with a wife and child. His mother and his sister were running a hotel in his native village. In order to surprise them, he'd left his wife and child at another hotel and gone to see his mother, who hadn't recognised him when he'd walked in. Just for fun, he'd decided to book a room. He'd shown them his money. During the night, his mother and his sister had clubbed him to death with a hammer to steal his money and then thrown his body into the river. The next morning, the wife had come along and without realising, revealed the traveller's identity. The mother had hanged herself. The sister had thrown herself down a well. I must have read this story thousands of times. On the one hand, it was improbable. On the other, it was quite natural. Anyway, I decided that the traveller had deserved it really and that you should never play around. And then towards the end, we get the trial and here we have... In the end, all I remember is that, echoing towards me from out in the street and crossing the vast expanse of chambers and courtrooms as my lawyer went on talking, came the sound of a nice seller's trumpet. I was assailed by memories of a life which was no longer mine, but in which I'd found my simplest and most lasting pleasures. The smells of summer, the part of town that I loved, the sky on certain evenings, Marie's dresses and the way she laughed. And the utter pointlessness of what I was doing here took me by the throat and all I wanted was to get it over with and to go back to my cell and sleep. I hardly even heard my lawyer exclaim finally that the jury would surely not send an honest worker to his death just because he forgot himself for a moment, and then appeal for extenuating circumstances since my surest punishment for this crime was the eternal remorse with which I was already stricken. The court was adjourned and the lawyer sat down looking exhausted, but his colleagues came over to shake hands with him. I heard a magnificent old chap. One of them even called me to witness. Eh? He said. I agreed, but it was hardly a sincere compliment because I was too tired. Here we have the start of chapter 5. Uh, for the first time, I've refused to see the chaplain. I've got nothing to say to him. I don't feel like talking and I'll be seeing him soon enough as it is. What interests me at the moment is trying to escape from the mechanism, trying to find if there's any way out of the inevitable. I've been moved to another cell. From this one, when I'm lying down, I can see the sky and nothing else. I spend all day watching its complexion darken as day turns to night. I lie here with my hands under my head and wait. I don't know how many times I've wondered whether there have ever been instances of condemned prisoners escaping from the implacable machinery, disappearing before the execution or breaking through the police cordon. I'd reproach myself every time for not having paid enough attention to stories of executions. You should always take an interest in these things. You never know what might happen. Like everyone else, I'd read newspaper reports. But there must have been special books which I'd never been curious enough to refer to. 
That was where I might have found stories of people who'd escaped. I might have discovered that there'd been at least one occasion when the wheel had stopped, that amongst so much that was inexorable and predetermined, chance or luck had just once managed to change something. Once. In a way, I think that would have been enough. My heart would have done the rest. The papers often talked about a debt being owed to society. According to them, it had to be paid. But that hardly appeals to the imagination. The vital thing was that there were... The vital thing was that there be a chance of escaping, of breaking out of this implacable ritual, of making a mad dash for it which would admit every possible hope. Naturally, that hope was of being shot down at a street corner in full flight and by a bullet from nowhere. But when I really thought about it, there was nothing to permit me such a luxury. Everything was set against it, and I was caught in the mechanism again. And then here I just want to end on this bit from the afterword that Camus wrote on the 8th of January 1955. A long time ago, I summed up the outsider in a sentence which I realise is extremely paradoxical. In our society, any man who doesn't cry at his mother's funeral is liable to be condemned to death. I simply meant that the hero of the book is condemned because he doesn't play the game. In this sense, he is an outsider to the society in which he lives, wandering on the fringe, on the outskirts of life, solitary and sensual. And for that reason, some readers have been tempted to regard him as a reject. But to get a more accurate picture of his character, or rather one which confirms more closely to his author's intentions, you must ask yourself in what way Mersold doesn't play the game. The answer is simple, he refuses to lie. Lying is not only saying what isn't true, it is also, in fact especially, saying more than is true and, in the case of the human heart, saying more than one feels. We all do it every day to make life simpler, but contrary to appearances, Mersold doesn't want to make life simpler. He says what he is. He refuses to hide his feelings and society immediately feels threatened. For example, he is asked to say that he regrets his crime in time-honored fashion. He, regret he replies that he feels more annoyance about it than true regret. And it is this nuance that condemns him. So uh, as you can tell, I did enjoy reading The Outsider by Albert Camus. I think it has some really interesting sort of philosophical questions of the reader. Uh, and so, you know, it's just enjoyable because of that. Um, it's not necessarily a page turner, although the plot does pick up in, in, in speed towards the end. But overall, really, it's more of a character study and um, holding up a mirror to some of the attitudes that we have as a society. And I'm all for that. So I gave it a pretty solid 4.25 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Outsider by Albert Camus. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.